Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our session, Shirts, Fears, and Cultural Exchange, Acceptance as Challenge and Opportunity. I'm Ayal Yada from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and it is my pleasure um, to host you in this session tonight. I will start by introducing our three speakers. The first one is Ms. Renate Evers from the MA program in Jewish Studies at Columbia University. And she also works as Director of Collections at the Leo Beck Institute, New York. She specializes in early modern German Jewish history and has already published several, several articles in the field, including in the Leo Beck Institute yearbook and in Jewish culture and history. The second speaker will be Dr. Susanne Korbel, uh, and she's an FBF-funded researcher and lecturer at the Center for um, Jewish Studies at the University of Graz, specializing in cultural studies, migration studies, and Jewish history. Her first book, which saw light earlier this year, investigates exchange and migration in popular entertainment between Vienna, Budapest, and New York at the Fender Sect. She has held fellowships in Jerusalem, New York, Southampton, and Tübingen. And the last speaker, Dr. Daniel Baranek, graduated at the Charles University in Prague. He was researcher in the Jewish Museum in Prague in 2018 to 2020, and now he conducts his research at the Institute of History of the Czech Academy of Science. He focuses on Jewish religious institutions, associations, and integration in the Bohemian lands in 1848 to 1942. Among his publications are two books in Czech, from 2015 and 2017, and many articles. We will now hear the three um, lectures, and then we will open up the discussion. So we'll start with Ms. Renate Evers, um, who will speak about the 1484 Nuremberg Jury Oath, more Judaico. Mm -hmm. Please, Renate. OK, thank you so much, Professor Eliana. So let me share my screen, one moment. Um, before I start, um, so can you see the screen and is my audio working? All confirmed? Terrific. So um, I'm going to do a little time um, walk. So my topic is the 1484 Nuremberg Jewry Oath. Since the medieval era, Jews had to take a special oath in certain um, court situations in many territories of the Holy Roman Empire. Here you see the legal code of the city of Nuremberg, which was first printed in 1484. The last pages contain regulations for us administering a jury oath. This was probably the first jury oath ever to be printed. It became the dominant model for oath formulas for several centuries. 14 years after the publication of the jury oath, Jews were expelled from the city. By 1499, the Jewish community had left Nuremberg. The free city of Nuremberg was an important trading and cultural hub. It was ruled by a group of, group of patrician families, became the center of German Renaissance and humanism, home to Albrecht Dürer, printing presses, and the first paper mill north of the Alps, which is depicted here. So you can basically picture it as the Silicon Valley of the age. Guilds had been abolished in the 14th century. Settlements of Jews in Nuremberg were recorded as early as 1146. Jews were under the protection of the Holy Roman Emperor. Flourishing phases alternated with phases of traumatic persecutions and expulsions. In the 13th century, the Jewish population constituted about 1,500 persons at its peak. And at the end of the 14th century, the Nuremberg Jewish community had dropped to a few hundred. Since the 1470s, the Municipal Council of Nuremberg had secretly petitioned the Emperor to get rid of its Jews. In 1498, the emperor approved the expulsion of the Jews from Nuremberg because he was in needs of funds. It was part of the deal that the expulsion was not linked to the city. The expulsion decree thus states, we Maximilian on our own initiative and with sufficient good reasons, we do hereby proclaim to the honorable, loving and loyal mayors and councillors of the city of Nuremberg that they shall expel all Jews and Jewesses from the said city. The entire Jewish community had to leave by February 1499. Jews were allowed to live in Nuremberg again only in the 19th century. 
back to 1484. The work that contains the jewelry oaths was an important innovative law collection in Germany. It was a result of a decade-long revision of the legal code for the city of Nuremberg. It attempted to strike a balance between customary, canon and Roman law, hence the title Die Reformation der Stadt Nuremberg. After some manuscript versions, the work was printed, then a brand new technology, and soon copied by many other cities. Um, as many in Kunabula, this work does not have a title page yet, but starts with a woodcut, left a version, version without coloring, and on the right side a colored version. The coat of arms and the two saints symbolize two political powers, the free city of Nuremberg over here, and then the Holy Roman Emperor over here, both rooted in Christianity. Right after the title woodcut, there is an excessive table of contents, 50 pages long. See a page on the left, and it's subdivided into chapters, chapters and subchapters. On the right side, a page with two brief laws. There's no page numbering yet. Initials are hand colored here in blue and red. The 1484 legal code was clearly meant to be a practical tool in the vernacular German, not in Latin. This is a sophisticated system here with 50 pages for finding individual laws which were very succinct. Some more eye candying after the table of contents, the quasi colophon can be found, followed by a two-page introduction before the actual laws start. Now let's look at the jewelry oath himself. The jewelry oath is located at the end of the volume, on the last four pages, the only chapter which is not numbered. It is not listed in the detailed table of contents. The Nuremberg Oath was strongly influenced by the 12th century Erfurt Oath. A single square vellum leaf at the Stadtarchiv Erfurt contains a carefully written German uh, jewelry Oath text with a seal attached to it. So here's the text, here's the seal, and this is an enlargement. The central function of the Oath, um, cons the central function of Oath in general, consisted in providing judicial, judicial evidence. It was a privilege to be able to perform an Oath Taking an oath could, for example, mean exemption from undergoing a trial by ordeal, which was also not a lot of fun. Um, a jewelry oath had to fulfill two conditions. First, it needed to be modeled after Jewish law to ensure that the jewelry oath taker considered the oath legally binding. Secondly, a jewelry oath had to neutralize the fear of Christians that the oaths of non-Christians were not valid. The assurance of the sincere intention of the oath taker was key. This is the text of the Erfurt Jewry Oath in Middle High German and here in English translation. But I don't want to bore you with the details. I want to um, show you more the structure. And it's straightforward. The oath formula starts with the reason for the oath. The innocence of the accused makes a lot of sense. Then God is called upon. And then um, horrific threats follow in case of perjury. For example, unnatural death, leprosy, in short, the entire breadth of God's commencement. So straightforward. And here in the Erfurt Oath, the composer has revealed it, um, itself, Archbishop of Congat for Mainz for the city of Erfurt. Taking an oath is actually a speech act, which was usually incorporated into ceremonial ritual, a role play, and involved a sacred object and was often performed in a public space. Taking an oath had some similarities for inner Christian and inner Jewish oath situation. Both had to swear on an object on a staff in the very old tribal times, it's called an Eidstabat ceremony, then on the New Testament or a relic and Jews on the Torah. The striking Erfurt vellum leaf was probably used in all ceremonies itself. The attached seal, have a look at that, faces the text upside down. So probably both parties held it and I mean, did the speech act and uh, were facing each other. The jewelry oath in the Schwabenspiegel, a 13th century Southern German law collection here in a 15th century version, was also influential for the Nuremberg Oath. The structure is similar to the Erfurt Oath. So first God's uh, creator is called upon, followed by a long list of threats and curses in the event of perjury, and that is just an excerpt. And what is different is first a ritual element. The oath taker had to stand on a pig skin, and here it is. Um, and second, the object is defined. Um, the oath taker had to place his right wrist um, into a Hebrew Bible, and that is absolutely crucial for the Nuremberg Oath. Um, a jury oath was by design an often dramatic, public, and sacred ritual that called out for divine judgment. The medieval court has also been duped a theater of terror. 
Medieval rituals were not necessarily absurd or humi humiliating at the time, but were considered to be a precaution against the possible interference of demonic powers. A word to the humiliating pigskin ritual. Historians today agree that degrading rituals such as the pigskin ceremony did take place, but were not as widespread and common as later generations per perceived them to be. Um, there's a study of 77 medieval German towns and villages that had a jury also in place, and only eight used the pigskin ceremony. And um, that study goes to Professor Toch at Hebrew University. Um, both the 12th century um, Erfurt jewelry oaths and the 13th century Schwabenspiegel oaths were important sources for the Nuremberg jewelry oaths. What was different? The Nuremberg oaths spelled out several auxiliary oaths or neben either to make sure that the process was valid. First, so it gets very bureaucratic. Is the Hebrew Bible a valid copy? Second, does the Ostiaker believe that Christians believe in the true God? And then third, is the Jewish oaths taker aware of that perjury is blasphemy and fourth, Will he speak the truth? And then after that, uh, the main oath ceremony could start and um, the jury oath, so that was the first one, um, the jury oath taker had to place his right hand up to his wrist into the Hebrew Bible. And that is the ritual which corresponds to the Schwabenspiegel version. And you remember that image. Um, and explicitly on, on verse Exodus uh, 27, I mean, it depends on how you count the commandments. I mean, in some version, it's the fourth. Um, you shall not swear falsely by the name of the Lord or your, go your God, and so on and so forth. So, problem solved. But next problem, how to find that verse if one does not know Hebrew? And the city council of Nürnberg came up with a smart solution. In the chapter on the jury oath, the fourth commandment is provided in the form of a Hebrew word-by-word -word transcription with German translation. I'll show it to you later in more detail. This was presented in a complex textual layout. Only then we, are finally, we finally reach the actual oath formula with the well-known elements. God the creator is called upon and then threats and maledictions in case of perjuries from both the Air Force Oaths and the Schwabenspiegel jury Oaths are added, and this is continued on page four, and so that is the jury Oaths. Um, so, and how did the Municipal Council of Nuremberg develop the jury Oaths, and especially the Hebrew transcription? Um, so it's, it has been known for a long time that a manuscript codex exists at the Staatsarchiv Nuremberg, which co uh, contains a collection of source pertaining to Jews in Nuremberg, including a collection of German jury oath formulas and research notes. What is depicted here is considered to be the original draft of the jury oath from 1484. This Ratschlagbuch 13 makes later reference to the pigskin ceremony from the Schwabenspiegel. It reflects consciously how humiliating and disgusting the ceremony would have been for Jews and hence not valid, and that's the key, and therefore the pigskin ceremony was not used in Nuremberg. Um, here's again the fourth commandment. We have it here in the printed version. And you, you see, um, so the, the, you have um, basically the German text, nicht erhebt den Namen des Herrn deines Gottes, and you have then the, the Hebrew transcript, and it's in the Ashkenazi pronoun. And this corresponds exactly to the uh, manuscript. Nicht erhebt den Namen des Herrn deines Gottes und dann wo Cisar und so on and so forth. And if you want to compare it to contemporary Hebrew, it, so the normal um, uh, verse would be Lotisa, El Shem, and so on and so forth. Um, the manuscript also recommends recruiting a group of three or four learned Jews and asking one after the other um, to find Exodus 27 in the Hebrew Bible, to read it in Hebrew and to translate it into German while the Christian administrator memorizes the page and compares the text based on the transcript. Overall, and so that's my point, <laughs> the city of Nürnberg went to great lengths to make sure that the jury oath was valid for both Jews and Christians. However, Jews were expelled within 14 years in 1498 and had to leave by 1499. So how does this go together? Moment. Um, it is therefore even more striking that the 1503 edition of the Nuremberg Legal Code, the second edition, four years after the expulsion of Jews from the city still explicitly included a jury oath. Did the printer just forget to remove the chapter or was the jury oath still in use? A strong clue that the jury oath was still 
uh, was kept deliberately in the 1503 edition is the fact that it was given two alphabetical index entries. And one entry was here under Eide, Eide der Juden, so zuletzt in der Reformation, and that is shown here. And this index was added to the 1503 edition, and the entire volume was received page numbering. However, you also see, and that is also very striking, everything else, every other law has a chapter and a subchapter and is numbered, except for um, the jury laws. Um, however, that the, that the, the oath was still there in 1503 can only mean that there was still a need for the jury oath in Nuremberg, and that business and other interaction between Christian and Jews in Nuremberg continued after the expulsion, however, outside the city, which is also confirmed in other sources and is also um, 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 confirmed for other cities, for example, the city of Strasbourg, um, that, um, that was um, a recent study. Um, basically, the transaction happened, um, continued outside the city. In, in 1522, Nuremberg, um, the 1522 Nuremberg reprint and subsequent editions on law contain the jury oath. So I'm, come, I'm wrapping up. So the 1484 Nuremberg jury oath is first and foremost the cutting edge innovative tool in line with the overall ambition, ambitious revision of the municipal legal code of Nuremberg. The jury oath aimed at integrating a minority group into the legal and economic framework of a dominantly Christian society. It combined Christian and Jewish elements so that both groups felt at ease about the validity of transaction. On the other hand, the 1484 Nuremberg jury oath is also a symbol of cynical realpolitik. The Nuremberg Municipal Council had secret plans to get rid of its Jews since they had lost its economic power and usefulness. And when the chance arounds of buying out the Jewish community from Emperor Maximilian I, the Municipal Council moved quickly and the Emperor even took the blame for the expulsion entirely on himself. The city remained publicly innocent and did not even incur expenses since it was able to sell the Jewish properties it took over to interested Christians. Um, this amb ambiguous relationship between the jury oath as an innovative legal tool, which helped to integrate the Jewish minority and the city's plans to get rid of its Jews, is also mirrored in the way the 1484 jury oath was incorporated into Nuremberg's brand new legal code. It is important and symbolic that the jury oath became part of the overall legal code, but it was only an added unnumbered chapter at the end of the book, which could easily be separated and removed. And ultimately, this probably envisioned separation did, play, did take place. The jury oaths disappeared over time from the legal court of the city of Nuremberg, and the Jews were expelled in 1499. However, the reality of the matter was not as black and white. The fact that the first reprint of the Nuremberg legal court in 1503, four years after the expulsion, still had the jury oaths, is an indication that this administration continued, I bet, outside the city, in addition, the, the jury oath was later incorporated into the Imperial Reichskammergerichtsordnung around 1538, 1550, printed 1555, and found a dedicated space there and was valid until the 19th century. So overall, the history of the 1484 Nuremberg jury oath is an important and ambivalent milestone in the history of Jewish-Christian relations. And um, so this was the, the short version. And... If you're interested in reading the long version, it was just published. You can also email me for um, a PDF. So thank you. Thank you very much, Renate. It was uh, both fascinating and really illuminating. Uh, we'll, go, we'll go right away to um, the second lecture by uh, Dr. Susanne Kobel, and she will speak about private spaces as spheres of Jewish and non-Jewish relations, encounter, encounters between Jews and non-Jews, in Viennese home. Susanne. Thank you for your kind introduction. I will just share my desktop and then start immediately. So, at the turn of the 20th century, Vienna, the capital of the Habsburg Empire, transformed into a metropolis of more than 2 million inhabitants. The vast majority of the population shared lavatories with their neighbors on the same floor or even within the entire building. They got running water from the basin in the hallway, their children played in the courtyards, and the adults gathered in the apartments. Those who could afford more comfortable living conditions lived in private apartments with their family members, but also others. 
both high society and average middle class families employed domestic workers who lived together with the families they worked for and had rooms in their homes. But what kinds of Jewish and non-Jewish encounters took place in private spaces in Vienna? Were relations formed out of these encounters? And if so, what did they look like? My presentation is based on the observation that Vienna around 1900 provided Jews and non-Jews with numerous opportunities to face encounters. Yet, the historiography on Jews during the emergence of modernity is still characterized by a narrative of private isolation. The result of this has so far been that Jewish history was conceived on the one hand as particular and not part of general history. On the other hand, it has artificially enshrined the spheres of housing and daily life, in particular as isolated enclaves that would not be suitable for Jewish and non-Jewish relations. I thus argue that we undervalue the impact of Jewish and non-Jewish relations in daily routines. This is why I will introduce um, four scenarios of encounters between Jews and non-Jews that took place inside Viennese homes. First, domestic workers. Second, bad lodgers. Third, Heimarbeiters, so workers at home. And fourth, sex workers. First. The increasing intimacy of bourgeois family homes and the movement of former female domestic work into the industrialized professions allowed prof positions for female domestic workers to increase. Nearly half of the women worked. Of these, every other woman, a total of almost 500,000 people in Vienna at the time, served as domestic workers. In their memoirs, Authors illustrate how they, as children or domestic workers, developed close relationships with their Jewish or non-Jewish mates or children. I will begin my presentation by presenting some examples of such. In his autobiography, Winds of Life, Evan Gershon, who was born Gustav Kiegler in Vienna, indicated that housekeeping made close encounters even inside private rooms unavoidable. Many Jewish families employed young girls as domestics. They came from villages not far from Vienna. The young women were not paid much, but had a room and a board, and most important, learned to cook and run a household. We too had a domestic at different times, the last one being Julia. She, more than any other of the girls, became almost a part of the family. Sundays were her days off, but she never went out, nor did she have a boyfriend. Gershon describes the relationship between the domestic staff and his family as particularly close, especially as they were the only people who interacted with their mate, Julia, who did not encounter anyone else while working for the Ziegler's. Hans Stein, another contemporary of um, Gershon, also reflected on the conditions of living in close proximity with non-Jewish domestic staff, given that they all lived in the family apartment. Even though our family was middle class, we had help running the household. It was customary to employ girls, mostly from the country, who wanted to come to Vienna, the big city. In our apartment, next to the kitchen was a little room, big enough for a bed and a small dresser with a washstand. This room was the room designated for the maid. And another contemporary of theirs, Kurt Schwarz, she had the memory of an even closer or more intimate relationship with his nanny. He remembered his and his sister's relationship with his nanny as being very close, stating, I am amazed how little contact I had with my parents, but I felt unbelievable close to my nana of Fräulein, with whom we, the two kids, slept together in a room. However, Jewish life in Feindersjäger Vienna comprised both the experience of well-situated families and those of a fresh arrival living in a small accommodation with at least five or more people. A massive growth of its population due to migration made the city's inhabitants having to share housing with their peers. Some numbers. About 20% of the Viennese population paid for a bed to sleep in for a few hours before the next bed gear, bed lodger, would settle in. 32% of available apartments hosted such tenants. And as we learned from Evan Gershom, whom I quoted at the beginning, this was not only among the most crucial factors affecting life, in life since privacy in home was less limited to family, 
life than we might imagine today, but also made Jews and non-Jews face regular encounters between one another. The city's population frequently lamented its Wohnungselend, housing misery, referring to the fact that usually up to 10 and sometimes even more individuals would be living in one small apartment. The tenant situation was so serious that the labor office frequently issued reports on the living conditions of the Viennese citizens. One study demonstrated that in 1901, more than 20% of the households sheltered an average of nine or more people, and especially the Jewish immigrants to Vienna from the eastern provinces of the Habsburg Empire were especially, um, were especially affected by that. The subsidized council housing project launched by the Social Democrats um, from the early 19 onwards improved living conditions, but the mass of refugees arriving during First World War still kept the average number of tenants high during the interwar period. Excuse me. And this brings me um, to the next field of interest I wish to talk about and of which Käthe Leichter make us learn of. Die Heimarbeit. Another factor that nourished the opportunities for Jewish and non-Jewish encounters in domestic spaces was that apartments also functioned as working spaces. A considerable number of people performed Heimarbeit in the same crowded conditions. Inside dwellings, workers who were not employed by a company produced shoes, clothing and trading goods in order to sell their products to traders. Such workers were overwhelmingly about 94% of female. Käthe Leichter conducted a study and concluded, families working at home who lived in one room with one kitchen whose refuge was the cellar or the poor house, female home workers who pursued their professions as subletters or bed lodgers, bed lodgers who performed their work at home during daytime sitting on a rented bed. For Leichter, speaking as a social democrat, what shaped her relation with the domestic workers? Um, excuse me, I missed here something. Um, so she not only conducted a study, but also reflected in her memoirs on her relations in her youth with the domestic workers on the, of the family. Um, and she shaped their relation with the domestic workers, um, not primarily primarily as a difference between Jewish and non-Jewish people, but as a difference in the social status. In a manner similar to other memoirs, Leichter countered the frequently stressed separation between the domestic workers and the family when describing her relationship um, with the domestic workers of her family. I was always happy to spend time in the kitchen where Silly, the old cook who had been in the household since my birth, told me stories and showed me how to play the sitter. I would often have to be fetched because I would once again be with these people. I especially liked it when Silly sat on my bed in the evenings when my parents were away and told me stories about her life. And like all children of the bourgeoisie, we asked the domestic worker where children come from. We would have never dared to ask our parents unsavory questions." Unquote. Such interactions between Jewish and non-Jews in private rooms provided important junctions for cultural exchange. Jewish children were often confronted with stories of angels and Catholic saints by their non-Jewish mates. For example, Elias Canetti recalled such an exchange with the maid of the family when they settled in Vienna between the beginning of the 1910s and the First World War. On New Year's Day, devout Jews stood on the banks of the Danube Canal and threw their sins into the water. Fanny, the maid who was with us, commented on this. She always had her own views on things and told them to us straight. It would be better if they didn't sin in the first place, she opined. Anyone can just throw them away. The word sin made her feel a bit uneasy and she really didn't like big gestures. And due to time, I will just shortly come to the last um, field of interest or field of interest for um, Jewish and non-Jewish relations in private spaces, namely sex workers. Another contemporary of Canetti and Leichter, S. Jerusalem, 
um, who was a member of Jung Wien, was not only a gifted writer, but also one of the founding members of the Movement for Sexual Education. In her 1909 work, The Heilige Scarabeus, The Holy Scarab, which was reprinted 22 times within the first year of publication, she discussed the connection between clandestine prostitution and housing spaces as being responsible for corrupting young people and serving as spheres of contacts between Jews and non-Jews. In the first part, entitled Die Schwarze Katharina, The Black Catherine, Jerusalem depicts a shared housing scenario involving two female, a Jewish and a non-Jewish protagonist, inside a building that serves mainly as a portal. There, Janke and Katharina live together autonomously, depending neither on the official structure of the portal nor on its operators. The two women share a small Küche cabinet apartment with um, Katharina's daughter Milada. A quite fortunate living situation for single women, given the challenging housing market. But still, in Jerusalem's depiction of the life of these two women from the lower social strata, they are not only they are only able to afford this apartment because they regularly earn money as sex workers. And in doing so, Katharina would usually take her clients back home, where they not only encountered her roommate, but also her daughter. And what is more, Jerusalem um, tells us vividly that in this field of encounters, um, Jews and non-Jews frequently interacted with one another. This brings me to my conclusion. The four outlined areas of daily contact inside domestic spaces vividly illustrate why I'm convinced that we need to broaden our narrative on the history of Jews in Vienna at the find a circle. Focusing on private spaces help us to add the experience of subtle and lifestyles to the historiography of Jews in Vienna. Without an adequate idea of the range of encounters that occurred, we undervalue private spaces and intimacy as a component of Jewish and non-Jewish relations and their contributions to the multiplicitous modes of togetherness that existed between groups of whom it has hitherto falsely been claimed that they lived in separate parts of the city. Future research, and this is my last statement, must thus seek answers to the question in how far such encounters, for example, help to overcome prejudices or if they just provided more chances for misunderstandings. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Susanne. This is really interesting. And now we'll get to our third and final talk um, by Dr. Daniel Baranek, Crossing the Ghetto Borders, Integration of Jews in Loschitz and Marisch Weisskirchen, 1848 to 1921. Daniel, please. Thanks for your work. I hope you, you see my presentation. Uh, emancipation of Jews in the half of the 19th century uh, brought freedom of movement to Jews in the Bohemian lands. Because of migration, new Jewish communities aroused, but the traditional ones suffered, uh, suffered from uh, an outflow of population. Uh, freedom of movement caused, uh, caused also shift of the Jewish population from ghetto to Christian part of towns. Uh, in this paper, I will focus on vanishing of ghetto borders in two Moravian towns, Did namely Hense, uh, Marisch Weifskirchen in German, and Loschitze, uh, Loschitz in German. Uh, you can see uh, the location of these two towns in uh, the slide. Official statistics uh, create an impression that migration led simply from a former ghetto to a Christian part of a town or uh, directly out of the town. Uh, even recent research had not surpassed the stereotype about the decline of traditional communities. Uh, however, deep analysis of demographics uh, situation uh, of the Jewish communities show much more complex image of Jewish migration. This analysis is based on a combination of data from census records and from old maps. Uh, in Hranice, 
there were actually two ghettos in the half of 19th century. Uh, on the left picture, in the middle, we can see the Jewish street, the central uh, ghetto, and also two small ghettos uh, on, in the southern and northern suburb. Uh, several Jewish families got permission to live in Christian houses already before 1848 and to perform craft or factory production there. Uh, but these were only individuals. After the promulgation of uh, 1849 constitution, individual Jews began to buy Christian houses and even more Jews rented an apartment in the Christian town. In 1857, uh, one third of Jews in Rense already lived in the Christian town. However, the Christian town, uh, Christian townspeople protested against uh, merging the Jewish quarter with the Christian town. So the uh, triple, uh, triple ghetto uh, had the, its own uh, autonomy uh, until 1919. Uh, we can see from the maps that Jews uh, firstly moved from uh, moved uh, from ghetto to streets close to, uh, close to the to the ghetto. However, in 1860s they started also to move uh, more and more to the town square. And uh, later also to suburbs. In 1869, only 43% of Rheinse Jews lived in ghetto, so uh, less than half. Uh, in 1921, uh, only 20% of Jews lived in ghetto. Uh, and mostly poor Christian workers and maids moved to the vacated uh, Jewish flats in uh, the former ghetto. In Loschita, we can uh, see the similar process, uh, but there are also some differences. Uh, Jews started to abandon Loschita ghetto uh, not before uh, 1848, but after 1849. Uh, individual Jews bought uh, several Christian houses, uh, as in, uh, in Hrenice, but uh, Jews did not rent so much uh, flats in the Christian town as uh, much as in Hranice. Like in, like in Hranice, uh, also in Loschice, Jews uh, moved mainly to the houses near, near the Jewish quarter and to the town square. Most of most of Jews in Loschice, however, still lived in ghetto, and the center of gravity of Jewish population shifted to the Christian town only after 1910. Uh, in Hranice, it was already after 1869, so there is a big difference, uh, and we can see that uh, ghetto in Loschice had much more greater permanency. Uh, The census data from Hranice and Loschice show that the shift of the Jewish population from ghetto to Christian town was not caused much by, by migration between Jewish and Christian part of the town. We can see that the waves uh, between the blue and yellow bars are uh, too thin. Uh, we can see that the most of newly settled Jews in Christian town did not come from Jewish town, but from outside the town. Uh, it's the red color. And uh, we can see that uh, most of the outside immigrants uh, settled down in the Christian town. So this made the shift of the gravity uh, from the ghetto to the Christian town. Uh, because the 
immigrants uh, moved mainly to a Christian town. Uh, this influenced also the uh, newborn ratio. So uh, the immigrants uh, regenerated uh, the po Jewish population in Christian town more than in uh, the Jewish quarter. So uh, the traditional Jewish communities were not declining as much as it is said. We can see that to, the, to some point in the town, uh, the outer immigration uh, was regenerating the uh, traditional Jewish community, uh, let's say, uh, until the turn of the 19th and, uh, and 20th century. Uh, the current research emphasized push factors, uh, economic reasons or anti-Semitism, which influenced Jewish migration. However, this analysis shows that much more important was that poor factors were weakened. In other words, uh, the Jewish population in Hranica and Lovchica declined. It's not because of anti-Semitic efforts to expel the Jews, but rather declined because attractiveness of the both towns decreased for uh, potential immigrants. The situation in Lovchica was a little bit different. Uh, we can see that uh, uh, outer immigrants preferred uh, to settle down in Jewish quarter, not in the Christian town. Uh, the census records do not allow to find out the cause why Jewish immigrants to Hranice moved rather to the Christian town, while immigrants to Lovchica uh, preferred the Jewish quarter. However, it is significant that in Hranice and Lovchica lived a German minority in which Jews were represented by different portion, proportions. Uh, in Lovchica, Jews represented uh, from 50 to 75 percent of the German minority. So they encountered a double barrier in the Christian town. Uh, they uh, they encountered not only religious, but also language or national barrier. On the contrary, in Hranice, Jews created only 20% of the German minority, so the migrants to the Christian towns found um, German allies uh, there in the Christian town. It is said that emigration from traditional Jewish communities was caused not only by economic decline of the rural towns, but mainly from uh, mainly by anti-Semitism. Uh, in Hranice and Lovchice, anti-Semitism was uh, in some period, periods very strong. However, its influence on migration is very doubtful. Uh, despite all efforts, I have not found a single clue that a single immigrant fled from um, uh, fled because of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism seems to be uh, at most on a secondary motive for migration. So to make some conclusions, a Jewish ghetto could have a lot of permanence, as we saw in Lostice, where more than half Jews lived in the ghetto even after half century after emancipation. The national composition probably played a role. Uh, if Jews moved, they rather extended the ghetto to stay close to the Jewish quarter. Uh, on after, let's say, 19, uh, 1900, Jews began to disperse in the Christian town and to suburbs. Uh, and the third conclusion is that anti-Semitism did not influence uh, the migration much. The decline of traditional communities was caused uh, by a decrease of attractiveness of the town. However, anti-Semitism influenced much the national and cultural preferences of Jews. Uh, in towns with a Czech ma majority, they more and more declared to be of a Czech rather than uh, rather than of uh, German nationality. Thanks for the uh, for the attention.
Daniel, and uh, thank you to the three speakers. Um, I will now open the discussion, and uh, we already have the first question from uh, the audience. So um, the question uh, goes to uh, Turanate regarding the Jewish oath, and the question refers to the to the pig skin that it was supposed to stand on. Um, what, was it supposed to, to symbol something? Was it a special insult toward the Jews? Do you know what is the history of this custom? Renate, please. Renate, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, wonderful. Can, can you see me? <laughs> yes. Okay, all the tests, perfect. Um, so um, the pigskin symbol, um, I think it's overall clear harassment and propaganda. It's a clearly um, an insult to Jews. I mean, because um, um, if you keep kosher, you don't eat pork. And so anything which has, which has to do with pigs is pretty much out of the question. So, I mean, in integrating um, a pigskin um, into the ceremony is clearly propaganda and harassment, <clears throat> which doesn't mean that it didn't happen. Mm. That study that I just mentioned that was done by Professor Toch as part of the Germania Judaica, and I mean, he, um, that was a sample of 77 cities, on of which eight mentioned or had it in place. And um, so it happened. Right, but more or less, it was a propaganda tool. And um, I, let me point to two. There are two cities, for example, Würzburg or Frankfurt. They had two or three versions of the jewelry oath in place. So very often they had a long version modeled after the Schwabenspiegel, and then they had a short version. And the short version didn't have the jewelry oath. And one reason was because when you wanted to use it, it had to be valid. And if, a, if um, a, a religious Jew is standing on a pigskin and swearing on a pigskin, for sure that oath is not valid. I mean, as crystal clear as that. And that was not the intention. Um, because if you wanted to have make business, the oath had to be valid. It had to be valid. So, and therefore I find it also very interesting in the contemporary discourse that many of these law collections basically say this is, I mean, excuse my English, it's bullshit. No? So, for example, the, the Ratsbuch in Nuremberg basically said, okay, we saw this in the Schwabenspiegel, it was mentioned, but we are not using that because it's insulting. And then there's also another law collection in um, northern Germany, which is called Weichbild Vulgata, it's a very weird name, and um, there it is called a Fantasterei, it's just fantasy, and they say that in the 13th century. No? So, however, dramatic elements um, in an oath situation, it's part of this speech act of the theater. The, the, the oath had to be valid. No? And um, sometimes they incorporated elements like thorns or standing in cold water. I mean, to make it very dramatic and very, I mean, to make sure um, that the person who was swearing, I mean, was saying the truth. No? So. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, another question to the, um, to the next speakers. Um, Susanne, um, if you could say a few words about how unique was this situation in, uh, in Vienna that you described. Um, so was it like this in, in maybe in every metropolis that was too crowded or was there something very unique about the situation in Vienna that you described? So thank you for the question. Um, so the discussions in the newspapers and the official press were like that the, especially the bad lottery situation was unique for Vienna in terms of intensity and in terms of numbers. Mm -hmm. Bad lotteries, of course, also existed in other European metropolises, but in Vienna, the number was especially high and also the number of, or the average number of people sharing um, one bed or settling in in one bed and living in one apartment this way was especially high. So, whereas in Paris it was about 10% of the population affected at that time, also in London about 10%, um, it was particularly high in Vienna, for example. Um, we don't have exact numbers for Budapest, for example, so this is still a broad field for future research, I would say. Wonderful, thank you. 
And um, one question to, to Daniel, if you could also um, elaborate a bit in a, in a comparative manner or look at the things from a, a comparative perspective. Um, you presented two case studies of two cities. Um, to what extent uh, uh, was it really um, representative of other places in, in, the, in, in the Czech Republic, in Bohemia? Um, or can we also compare it maybe to other processes in the German-speaking world? Uh, well, uh, I worked on it. Uh, we saw that uh, there were two models. The model where Jews preferred uh, the Christian town and model uh, where Jews uh, preferred uh, the Jewish quarter. Uh, we saw that uh, the Jewish quarter in Loschitze uh, was very strong and uh, had uh, long permanence. Now I am working on other cities uh, uh, in the Bohemian lands, so I can I cannot confirm or uh, say uh, in which extent the model, which model was uh, main or, uh, but I think that uh, uh, Hranice or uh, is really model, not only the singular uh, case of, uh, of some of some town. Thank you. And and just one more question. We see we see the differences, for example, oh. in. Uh, um, can, can you hear me? Yes. So we see the differences, for example, between uh, um, Susanna's research and and your own. So she was working with very personal documents, ego documents. Are you going and you're going more in the direction of statistics and, and diagrams. And my question is, do you also combine? Um, more like ego documents referring to these processes that you that you analyze? Are you trying to show a more uh, personal perspective on these issues? If it is possible, then yes. But, uh, you know, the ego documents are mainly preserved for the greater cities, not for rural towns. Uh, but uh, there are some documents uh, uh, which describe the situation in Jewish ghetto in Kolin, which I now I'm working on. So, uh, yes, it it gives a little bit more plastic, uh, plastic uh, picture. For example, in Kolin, uh, we saw that also Christian moved uh, to the ghetto, uh, to the vacated uh, Jewish flat, and uh, this mixture. Uh, wasn't uh, see uh, wasn't uh, seen as uh, negative because uh, in Shabbat uh, Jews hired the Christian neighbors uh, to make a uh, fire um, and to light uh, to, to light the lights. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have one more question that came in um, again to uh, Renate and the Jewish oath. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is, was there a rabbinical reaction to, this Jewish, to these uh, Jewish oaths mm -hmm. and recommendations on how to deal with them, recommendations right. for the Jews? Um, so there are some, um, 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 there are some, there are some responsa literature where um, basically these Christian Jewry oaths are mentioned, but it's not as widespread as one would think. Um, because it is this um, this jury oath is more a legal tool to conduct business. No, I mean clearly that, and that was a tool and a privilege to do that. However, I mean there's one case um, from Rotenberg um, that had something to do with coin clipping, and some Jews were had been swearing um, um, that. Um, 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 they, they, they did this, but basically said um, they did a, a false oath by claiming mental cancellation. <laughs> That's how, how that is called. But um, the rabbi in that case, um, I mean, strongly condemned that. No? So, I mean, you should not swear falsely. However, there is some responsa literature about that. Mm, um, that it is permissible for Jews to, um, um, to swear a, a, a false oath 
uh, if the accused Jew was innocent according to Jewish law, and that was the reason, or if um, another Jew was in a life-threatening situation, then the rabbis um, allowed to swear a false oath. And then they, they called this by mental cancellation. So in your head, you cancel the oath. Um, and to a certain degree, this was known by Christians. And so this fear that the oath was not valid and um, so adding things to the oath situation. But I just wanted to say to the other question, I mean, again, to this pig skin business, um, this is basically also a propaganda tool, an anti-Semitic propaganda tool, right in line with blood libel, poisoning mm -hmm. of wells, and I mean, the whole gamut. Mm, so. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a few more minutes, and I would like to take this opportunity and ask each one of you to, to locate what you've just presented in the broader project you're working on. And like, I mean, right now you just presented a, a sample, a short fragment of the project. If you could expand a bit on it, but we really have just, you know, one minute for each one of you to, to tell us just a bit more about, uh, about your project and, and how it fits in. Um, so Renata, maybe we start with you. Um, so I'm very interested in micro studies um, and to combine it with material culture and, and um, also my fascinate, fascination of, of the transition be between oral culture, written culture, printing and how it um, still lined up, uh, was parallel to certain times, at certain times. But one of, one of my, my fascination is um, okay, so the history of the Jews of Nuremberg is well researched. The Jewry is well researched. Um, so, however, um, um, so finding connections to the past, um, studying the past, it's always distorted. I mean, because you only have certain documents and they tell it from a, a specific agenda. But um, so we can look at that again uh, and see if we can get other clues out of that, no? because we can't always find another Geniza who is telling us um, everything about um, uh, other things or groups that were not represented. But um, okay. so that's what I'm interested in. So, Thank you. Uh, Susanne. Thank you also for the question. Um, so basically, I'm interested in the history of everyday life of Jews in Habsburg Central Europe, whereas for the German territories, there exists a rich research on everyday history of Jews and non-Jewish relations and so on and so forth. There is a kind of lack for the everyday history um, of Jews in the Habsburg Empire. And this is what I'm interested in general. And I'm in the process of shifting my research at the moment from public spaces to private spaces for both capitals or residential cities of the empire, so Vienna and Budapest. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Daniel? Uh. I have already mentioned that I'm working on more more towns mm -hmm. uh, to find out uh, some models or types of uh, Jewish communities. But this uh, demographical uh, aspect is only one aspect. I also uh, study uh, the associations in the in these towns and how Jews were involved in a uh, mainly non non Jewish associations and in the administration of the towns. Wonderful. So thank you very much. Um, if I can just sum up this entire uh, session. So we talked about the the shared spheres and the cultural exchange from three different perspectives. We had the legal perspective. We had uh, a more personal one of really. A very close uh, physical uh, encounter in the private spaces, and we had uh, a demographic and uh, like in a settlement political um, um, exchange, and we also, you know, took you uh, into a tour from uh, Nuremberg to Vienna and then to the Bohemian land, and also in time we started in the early modern period and moved on to the 19th and 20th century, and I think you. The three of you gave us a wonderful uh, perspective and insight into, into this topic. So I would like to thank all of you and thank you to the audience for joining us. And we can continue the discussion and the conversation in the breakout room.
So we will see you soon in the breakout room. Thank you and goodbye. Okay. Thank you.